Uh, well, welcome to our little seminar on uh, Shakespeare. I'm sure that many of you are great admirers of Shakespeare. I'm glad to see so many young people interested in this problem because it really is quite a mystery. <clears throat> and um, let me just read to you some of the statements that have been made by various writers on this uh, question. For example, um, uh, in uh, Joseph Sobrand's book, alias Shakespeare, he writes, there is no match between the known facts about the man and the works assigned to his authorship. Shakespeare's life and personality have no discernible relation to the plays and poems bearing his name. <clears throat> and then we read in uh, the Shakespeare Conspiracy, the life of William Shakespeare is shrouded in mystery. There is no record of him receiving an education, buying a book, or writing a single letter, and no original manuscript of a Shakespeare play survives. And there were 38 of them, and not a single page of, of uh, original manuscript has survived. Uh, yeah, I turned that down. Uh, there is no direct record of his conversations, and no one in his home, in his hometown, seems to have known that he was a successful playwright while he was alive. There is not even a contemporary portrait to reveal his true appearance. Now, <clears throat> how did Shakespeare's name get on all of these plays? In the first place, you have to understand four important dates. And of course the question is, if he didn't write the plays, plays, who did? That's the main question. If Shakespeare didn't write them, somebody else must have. And who would that individual have been? Well, there have been a number of contenders. The uh, Francis Bacon. Some people claim that it was probably Francis Bacon, but Bacon had no reason to hide the fact that he wrote you know, 38 plays. Why would he hide that? Uh, he was a writer in his own right. He wrote scientific works. And there's nothing in his will that suggests that he wrote any plays that he was keeping from the public. So you can count out Bacon. The second contender is the Earl of Oxford. And the only problem with the Earl of Oxford is he too didn't leave any indication in his will or anywhere that he had written these plays, and in fact, he died before a good many of them were written. So he's not much of a contender, although there's a very large group of people who really pushed the Oxford theory. The only other individual who could have written the plays, who had the talent to write them, and had already written a, a, a number of, of marvelous plays, was Christopher Marlowe. But they all say that, well, Christopher Marlowe and Shakespeare were born in the same year. They were the same age. That is, they were both born in 1564, and you had Shakespeare here and Marlowe here. And suddenly, now, Marlowe, what was his education? The King's School in Cambridge scholarship. Cambridge University, six years scholarship. And then he goes to London and produces Chamberlain one, Chamberlain two, Dr. Faustus, The Massacre at Paris, uh, Dido, Queen of, of Carthage, um, and um, Edward II. Plus, he wrote Ovid's Elegies. He translated Ovid into English. And uh, so he had, he had a fantastic education and was a genius. There's no question about that. He was a genius, and he invented blank verse. He was the inventor of blank verse. He was revolutionary. But he was supposed to have been killed in 1593. Now, we know about his education, and we know about his plays, and poems, 
But until 1593, we know nothing about Shakespeare. He didn't write a line. Nothing. All we do is have records of his marriage and baptisms and all of that, but nothing indicating that he was a writer of any kind. But in 1593, Marlowe was supposedly murdered. Now, why was he murdered? Or why, was he, why, did, why did they pretend that he was murdered? Well, Marlowe was very, expo very outspoken. He was a maverick. He was a genius. And uh, he got into a lot of trouble with the government because of his views. And he was going to be hanged. He was going to be executed. And his protectors, uh, Thomas Walsingham, who was the cousin of Francis Walsingham, who incidentally, Francis Walsingham was the head of Queen Elizabeth's CIA. And he was also known by Lord Burley, who the two top men in Elizabeth's government knew Marlowe very well because Marlowe was at Cambridge. Burley was the chancellor at Cambridge, you see. And Marlowe, during this period, was also recruited into the Secret Service. He became a spy for the government. And what were they spying on? Well, in those days, there was a tremendous uh, battle going on between the Catholics and the Protestants in England. And, and Elizabeth's Protestant government was determined to prevent the Catholics from taking over as they did during Bloody Mary's reign. Now, who is Bloody Mary? Where did she come from? Well, as you know, the rift with the, with the, with the church, with the Pope, began with Henry VIII. Henry VIII was the one who broke relations with the Pope because he wanted to divorce his Catholic wife, Catherine of Aragon, and marry Anne Boleyn. And when the Pope did not, did not permit that, he broke with the Pope. And so that began the Protestant reign in England. <clears throat> but what happened was that when Henry died, his son, his young son, took over, Edward. And he was too young to reign on his own. He was only like 12 years old or something like that. And he was also sickly. And, uh, but he was still, he was still, he maintained the Protestant uh, government in England. But then, when Edward died, his sister Mary, who was a devout Catholic because she was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, she brought the Catholics back into power in England and you had hundreds of Protestants executed. That's why they call it Bloody Mary. It was a tyrannical period of time. Well, now when Mary died, Elizabeth took over. Elizabeth was the daughter of Anne Boleyn, a Protestant. And so she brought the Protestants back into power. And the Protestants, because of what they had lived through with Mary, were determined to never let the Catholics take over England again. But you had a lot of Catholics in England. And there were a lot of Catholics determined to, bring, to get England back into the, into the Catholic fold. And so there was this constant battle going on. There were Catholic students at Cambridge. And Marlowe was recruited by Francis Walsingham, who was the top man uh, in, in Elizabeth's government as far as uh, intelligence was concerned, and Lord Burley, the treasurer, <clears throat> they were recruiting bright young students from Cambridge and Oxford to become spies for the government. Now, Marlowe was a genius, and they knew it, because he was re writing these plays, and he was becoming the foremost playwright in England, and so he was considered a very important member of the, uh, although not, not a very experienced member, he was a young man, but he was considered important enough in the Secret Service. So, now Marlowe, as I said, was also very outspoken, and his views on religion were quite unorthodox. And at that time, during Elizabeth's time, the, the Archbishop Whitgift, well, Whitgift was going after two types of people. He was going after atheists, and Marlowe was considered an atheist, and he was going after the Puritans, the radical Puritans, because the radical Puritans, Puritans uh, did not approve 
of the Anglican Church. They thought that the Anglican Church, Anglican Church, was too wishy-washy. It wasn't. It wasn't as um, strictly godly as were the Puritans. And incidentally, it was the Puritans who then migrated to America, who had to leave England because they were being persecuted in England. They left England and came to the United States and set up the Puritan Commonwealth here in, in America. And that's where we get our, the so-called Puritan religion, came from the Puritans. And uh, so Whitgift was hanging atheists and Puritans. And there was very definitely the threat that Marla was going to be hanged. There's some, some evidence had been found about what he had been saying regarding religion, and he was before the Privy Council, and they knew that he would be condemned to death, his supporters. And so they decided, how can we save Marla? He's a genius. We can't let him be, uh, be hanged. We can't let him be executed. He's a genius. How can we save him? Well, what we'll do... We'll stage a phony murder. We'll get somebody, somebody else's body and say that that's Marlow and he was murdered. And then we'll send Marlow abroad and he'll continue his work under a new identity. And he, uh, and he took on the identity of a Frenchman. Monsieur Ledoux. Marlow became a Frenchman working for the English Secret Service. That's, that's the, that's the um, research that has come to us in the last few years about Marlowe's uh, work as a secret agent in England after his supposed murder. Now there was an inquest, a coroner's inquest that declared Christopher Marlowe is dead. And so he was out of danger as far as being, you know, hanged or prosecuted because he no longer was around. He was proclaimed dead. Now, that was 1593. But he continued to write. And how could he get his stuff published and get it to the public? He couldn't put his name on it. So they had to find somebody else whose name they could use. And whose name did they use? William Shakespeare. Who was William Shakespeare? He was an actor. He became part owner of the theater. And so his name appears first in 1593. William Shakespeare, who had never written a word in his life, never published a word in his life, suddenly emerges as a literary genius. Not as a beginner, but as a genius having written Venus and Adonis. One of the great uh, epic poems of the uh, Elizabethan era. No education, and yet all of a sudden he emerges as this genius writing Venus and Adonis. And also it is dedicated to the Earl of Southampton. Now who was the Earl of Southampton? He was a young fellow, very wealthy, who had a bad father, and so Lord Burley took charge of him. Lord Burley became his foster son and put him into Cambridge University where Marlowe was still there. So Marlowe, Southampton, Burley at Cambridge. <clears throat> and um, so obviously Marlowe got to know uh, Southampton. I mean, there was no, uh, uh, it, we assume that they knew one another. You know, Cambridge was not so big in those days where you didn't know one from another and Burley knew that Marlowe was one of his secret agents and so Burley wanted the, the Earl of Southampton to marry his granddaughter and so he had Marlowe write sonnets to the Earl of Southampton urging him to marry to get married and those are the first sonnets in in the so-called Shakespeare sonnets. All you have to do is read them, and you'll see that those that first series of sonnets is uh, are about one, a person urging somebody else to get married. And he took advantage of the fact that he knew Marlowe and that Marlowe was a genius and could write beautiful poetry, and so he had him write these sonnets. It works out perfectly, you see, from a biographical and chronological point of view. Chronologically, everything fits perfectly with Marlowe being the author. Now, so here you have Shakespeare, 
His name appears on, I believe, nine plays. Nine plays. And, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you which plays his name appears. Um, Now, in all, let me see there. Um, let me see. The total number of plays I thought was 38 or 36. Uh, I'm sorry, the 36 plays, not 38 plays, was the total number of plays that, Shakespeare, that come under Shakespeare's name. The plays... Now, when I say that they were that these were uh, these were quartos, that is, these were plays that were published before the first folio. The first folio was published in 1623, long after Shakespeare was dead. That was the total collected works of supposedly Shakespeare. But the plays that were published, for example, Venus and Adonis was was published in 1593. That was the first so-called Shakespeare publication. And the next was in 1598. So, you know, that's five years later before Shakespeare's name appears on another work, and that was Love's Labor's Lost. And then you have to wait another two years before his name appears on any other play. It appears in 1600 on four plays, Midsummer Night's Dream, Merchant of Venice, Henry VI, Part Two. Much Ado About Nothing. Then two years later, his name appears on The Merry Wives of Windsor. The next year, in 1603, it appears on a publication of Hamlet. In 1600, five years later, uh, it appears on uh, a printed copy of King Lear. And in 1609, it appears on Troilus and Cressida. So out of 36 plays... Shakespeare's name only appears on nine published plays prior to his death. His name also appears on other plays that are not considered part of the Shakespeare canon. So apparently his name was being used promiscuously, you know, around the place. And in those days, the, the name of the author was, was not as important as it is today. Just as, for example, you see a lot of movies and you have no idea who wrote the script. You know, they don't publicize the writer of the script. But Marlowe became famous because of Tamerlane. Tamerlane was, such a, was, was so well received that he had to come out with a sequel, Tamerlane II. So he became rather well known. And, uh, but uh, Shakespeare was not known as a playwright, even though his name appeared on those nine plays. So... Nine plays until his death in 1616. <clears throat> in 1616, Shakespeare, well, he retired earlier than that. I think he, he retired in 1613, and that's probably when Marlowe died. And so he didn't have any more plays to, you know, to uh, sign. But anyway, uh, we don't know when Marlowe actually died. We don't know whether he, he died of natural causes or committed suicide. You know, who knows? But we know that Shakespeare died in 1616, and he left a will. There is no mention in the will of anything relating to the writing of anything. There is no mention of even owning a book. Nothing. And when Mark Twain wrote, read that particular will, he said, Will is pulling something over our eyes. There have always been a number of people who have been, you know, who have been, uh, who realized that Shakespeare couldn't possibly have written these plays. It was uh, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, and, and certainly Mark Twain and others in that uh, category of, of rather famous people who began to realize that this man didn't write the plays. Now, so we have his will and there's nothing in there alluding to the writing of anything. Now, Shakespeare's daughter married a doctor who was very, very well informed and wrote a book in Latin, a medical book in Latin, and he didn't even mention that his father was a great writer. When Shakespeare died, in fact, 
There was no mention of it anywhere. They didn't carry his body to Westminster Abbey. He was buried in the local churchyard. There was no indication at all that this man was the, the great genius to write these plays. First of all, his name was only on nine plays up to 1616. Well, then in 1623... A group of men decided to gather all of, quote, Shakespeare's works and put them in the first folio. That's this famous book in which all of uh, the works of Shakespeare appear. Now, who was behind that syndicate? Behind that syndicate was a man by the name of Edward Blount. Edward Blount. Who was Blount? He was a publisher. He knew Marlowe personally. He knew Thomas Walsingham, Marlowe's patron, personally. And we have that documentation because he, you know, he dedicated things and all of that. And he was the one who got, uh, put together the, the first folio. There are 36 plays in the first folio. Uh, 16 of them had been published in one form or another, in what we call quartos. Only nine of them were signed with... Where did the other 20 plays come from? You see, that's the mystery. Where did Edward Blount find 20 unpublished plays, many of which had never been produced? Where did he find them? Obviously, he knew where to find them. He knew that Marlowe had, co had to continue to write them, and he was able to get those manuscripts. And incidentally, those manuscripts had to be rewritten by scribes in order, because, you know, handwriting. <clears throat> now, there are 36 plays published, and not a single page of manuscript exists. Why? They had to hide the fact that these plays were written by Marlowe. Because if it came out that Marlowe had not been killed, and that was writing these plays, and that they knew about it, they'd all be hanged. So they had a very good reason to hide the fact that Marlowe wrote these plays. Marlowe was the only person who could have written the plays. There is no other individual in England who had the knowledge, the education to have written these plays. And these plays are full of information that can only come from somebody who had spent six years at Cambridge. It's as simple as that. That's the, that's the internal qualities of them. And then, and then scholars for generations have understood this very, very strange relation between the work of Marlowe and the work of Shakespeare. Some of them, some of them have, have claimed that Shakespeare was obsessed by Marlowe. He quotes Marlowe constantly. <laughs> you know. For ex I'll give you a very good example. In, in, uh, for example, in, in Hamlet. Many of you are familiar with Hamlet, the play Hamlet. Are you familiar with the scene where um, the actors come to the palace because Hamlet has hired them because he wants them to put on a play that's going to trap his his uncle. And so he welcomes the uh, the troop of actors and he says to them, gee, I'd like to see a sample of your work. Could you uh, give us a little uh, demonstration of how well you perform? And then Hamlet muses and he says, why don't you give me some sa uh, a passage from this play about Priam uh, uh, killing the king of Troy? Now that's all in Dido. You see, that's Marlowe had that that big scene where Aeneas, who escaped from Troy, tells Queen Dido, describes to Queen Dido how Priam killed uh, the king of Troy. And Marlowe uh, and and uh, Hamlet says it was a wonderful play. Uh, he gives his own play a, a plug. You see, it was a great play. He says, but it wasn't appreciated by the general audiences. It was caviar for the general. And uh, it, it's marvelous how he, you know, um, uh, toots his own horn. Uh, 
in that way. The actor then gives us a parody of that passage in Dido, in, in Dido, Queen of Carthage. Now what author would have the audacity to quote from another author in that way? It's just doesn't, it's not done, you don't do it. But, but uh, <clears throat> Shakespeare's plays are full of all kinds of indications. Marlowe put inside each play, you can always find something of Marlowe there that indicates, hey fellas, I wrote this, you know. I'll give you an, uh, a, a very good, another good exp uh, example in Measure for Measure. There is a body switching scene, you know, where the person to be hung is not hung, but somebody else's body is put in his place. Well, that's telling you exactly what happened uh, to Marlowe back in, in 1593 when he was supposedly murdered. And you will find this, this sort of stuff all throughout the so-called Shakespeare canon. These, these uh, references to uh, lines from Marlowe, uh, references to, to Marlowe, uh, indications that it, it could only have been written by Marlowe, for example. Uh, I forget which play it was, but one of the plays uh, is based on a, um, on a story by Plautus which had not been translated into English. She had to know Latin in order to be able to use that play. And uh, Shakespeare didn't have the education, so but Marlowe did. And also everybody says that, that Ovid was Shakespeare's favorite poet. Ovid. Well, Ovid was Marlowe's favorite poet. In fact, Marlowe translated Ovid into English. He translated the elegies into English. So. Isn't it a coincidence? All these interesting coincidences. Marlowe's uh, overt career ends, Shakespeare's begins in the same year. Uh, then you have the, they both share this love of Ovid. Uh, there's so much that goes on between these two that uh, even, even uh, uh, Rouse, the, um, the author of the biography of Southampton, states that there is this relationship between uh, Marlowe and Shakespeare that is hard to explain. You know, they can't figure it out. But, now who did figure it out? The first person to figure it out was Calvin Hoffman. He wrote a book <coughs> entitled The Murder of the Man Who Was Shakespeare, and I believe it was first published in, let's see, the date, 19... 1955. 1955, that's the same year that Why Johnny Can't Read was published. You know. <laughs> Incidentally, I'm also the author of Alpha Phonics, so if any of you need a good phonics program, uh, see me at my desk. But in any case, uh, this book was published in 1955, and during that time, in, in the late 50s, uh, I was an editor at Grosset and Dunlap in New York City. And we had a, uh, a quality paperback line called Universal Library, and I was in charge of that. And Hoffman came to me, and he said, I'd like, I, he submitted his book for publication in paperback. And so I read this, and I was converted to the Malo theory. Because I had assumed, like most people do, that Shakespeare's authorship was established, well established by documentation. But it isn't. That's what all of us think. We all, because they've written these fat biographies of Shakespeare, all based on guesswork, all based on, they assume, for example, he must have studied Latin because the plays are full of Latin. But the truth of the matter is that he didn't. It was Marlowe who knew the Latin, you see. Or that he got this from, or that he must have been to Italy because he gets such a marvelous um, uh, account of some of these Italian cities that you, only someone who was there could have written them. And we know that Malo, <clears throat> as a secret agent, had been traveling. He had been to France, he had been to England, and that sort of thing. Uh, so they've written these, these biographies around Shakespeare that are uh, totally false, totally, totally based on, uh, on conjecture. <clears throat> 
And, uh, and that's why people actually believe that Shakespeare wrote the plays, because they say, well, how could anyone write a 400-page biography of a man who didn't actually write the plays? You know, he had to write them. But it gives you an idea of what kind of uh, conspiracy or um, can exist in history. And this, one, this particular conspiracy involves the greatest author of all time. Shakespeare is acknowledged as being the premier writer of all time, and everybody knows him, not only in, in, in the English-speaking world, but throughout the, the world in general, where he is um, appreciated and translated and all of that. And yet, if you understand that it was Marlowe who wrote the plays, and everything begins to make sense. All of the, all of the biographical allusions begin to make sense. For example, take for example the sonnets that are supposed to be um, autobiographical. Now remember, Marlowe was forced to write, was forced to live uh, incognito after 1593. He was forced to live underground. We don't know exactly where he lived. We have indications of his travels in Europe that as, as a secret agent and we know that through the papers of Anthony Bacon, the brother of Francis Bacon, who was in charge of uh, uh, the Earl of Essex's uh, intelligence uh, network. And apparently, uh, Marlowe was, was part of that network. <clears throat> but, he had it, but here he wrote all these marvelous plays. He could not claim credit. He had to keep his, his identity uh, hidden. And so he wrote in this, in Sonnet 29, When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate. You see? So there you are. I mean, all of a sudden it makes sense. This was not written by, sh by a Shakespeare who was, um, you might say, uh, certainly not living in an outcast state. Shakespeare was having a wonderful time making a lot of money, buying real estate, buying grain, uh, suing people. He was great when it came. That's why we have so much information about Shakespeare, but it's all legal information, buying and selling, suing people, and that sort of thing. So that's a brief outline of this. There's so much more. I'm writing a book on the subject. Hopefully it'll be published in, in a year or so. And I do a very good chrono chronological job in which I show year by year, play by play, how all of this uh, took place. And I try to answer some of the, some of the questions that uh, still plague us today. But if any of you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to uh, answer. Yes, ma'am. Among the academia, how um, how well considered or, or thought of is the, the idea that Shakespeare was Marlowe, and is it, is it not? Is it taking on any kind of steam? Uh, the no, the academic world is totally uh, is totally committed to Shakespeare being Shakespeare, and now the only reason why Shakespeare is uh, has that claim is because when these men put together the first folio. 36 plays, they had to put somebody's name on it. They couldn't put Marlowe's name on it, so they put Shakespeare's name on it. But nobody in Shakespeare's family came forth and said, hey, pay us for this. You know, where are the royalties for these uh, 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 plays? Nothing. They did it because they had to put somebody's name on it. That's it, you see. So academia has gone along with that, you know. Uh, Has there been any uh, plays of Shakespeare ever? No, there couldn't because he was not a writer. He was not a writer, period. You know, he couldn't write these things because he wasn't, you see. He was just a name. Yes, sir? Why Shakespeare? Why would they pick William Shakespeare to be the scapegoat or whatever? I think they chose as Shakespeare because they could trust him. He was a uh, kind of person who was, that, who could be, a conf uh, in which they could have confidence that he would not reveal anything. They paid him well. That's why he became very rich, you know. So where did he get this money from? I'm sure that he was paid well for his work. 
Yes, sir. Or maybe Shakespeare found out about him and he was suing um, Marlo for blackmailing him and in, in order for the, in return he would give him a slave. No, I, I don't think that was the problem because uh, Shakespeare, remember these, these men were the same age and Shakespeare had no background at all and was not about to get into trouble with Burley or Walsingham. Remember, Marla was protected by Burley and Walsingham, the two highest men in Elizabeth's government, the top men. So if anything, he would become their servant and not their blackmailer. I mean, he would have he would have been killed so in, so quickly. You you couldn't you know would have never have happened. Yes, ma'am. Has anyone done any linguistic comparisons between yeah. plays that that's the grammar vocabulary? Right, you know? that has been done. A fellow by the name of Mendenhall did that, and it showed that the Shakespeare, the Marlowe canon, and the Shakespeare canon have identical traits as far as vocabulary, uh, word usage, and that sort of thing. That has been done. Yes, yes, ma'am. I just saw an ad in an archaeology magazine saying that there's another fella about that time period who actually did get shipwrecked and wash up on shore in France and did a lot of things in Marlowe's play. Have you read anything about that? No, I haven't. I haven't. Where did you read this? Is I mean, it recent? Yeah. Um, there was just like a one-page verbal about it. And I missed the video. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, there's been so much conjecture and uh, about all of this because. Uh, most of your academics uh, uh, believe that Marla was actually killed, you know. So then they have to make up all of these, all of these uh, different things, you know. Yes, sir. If, if Marla was so tight with the, the hierarchy in, in the government, why was he then to be executed? Well, because you had a rift in the government. You had you had a rivalry there, and he was, uh, you know, uh, and incidentally. The, the body that was used, that we believe was used to substitute for Marlowe, was a Puritan who was executed the day before, John Penry. John Penry was a radical Puritan who was hanged one day before the so-called murder. And it is believed that it was Penry's body, because that was a very private hanging that was not publicized. And I'm sure that people like Burley and others knew how to take advantage of that and to use that body to substitute for Marlowe. So, but there was this, there you had tremendous rivalries among factions in Elizabeth's uh, government, you know. And by 1623 it was James, I believe, who was already, uh, no, was it James? It was, no, no, it was Elizabeth, Elizabeth, um, no, in 1693 Elizabeth was still on the throne, yeah. <clears throat> Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. So he, did, you know, they sent him. They sent him out. And the interesting thing is that the so-called Monsieur Le Doux, uh, his papers were recently discovered in London in a uh, in a box uh, by um, researchers doing research among the papers of Anthony Bacon. And they found this list of books that had been purchased by Monsieur Ledoux in Italy and France, and the amounts that were paid for them and all of that. So the evidence is really accruing quite, quite substantially that Mala was not only alive, but you know had to be alive in order to write these plays. Nobody else could have written them. You see, it's as simple as that. I would say the most substantial proof of Marlowe's existence after his supposed death are the existence of these plays. Nobody else could have written them. You see. Uh, any other questions? <coughs> yeah, yeah. Does Ledoux mean the second? No, no, le, uh, the sweet. Ledoux, D-O-U-X, Monsieur Ledoux. And now where did the name Monsieur Ledoux come from? Well, it turns out that, that uh, Marlowe was born in Canterbury in 1564. And in those years, there were a lot of Huguenots, French Huguenots, who had taken refuge in Canterbury. They were the French Protestants who were being persecuted by the Catholics. And there was a family in uh, Can Canterbury by the name of Ledoux. And the theory is that Marlowe simply took on that name from that family. 
Ledoux because it's not a very uh, common name. And the, the fact that, the, that he might have known that family because where did Marlowe go to primary school? He might have gone to the, the Huguenot school and learned French because he was fluent in French. And that's why he was also recruited into the Secret Service because since he was fluent in French, they could send him over to, to France to spy on the Cath uh, English Catholics who had a seminary in Reims. And uh, that's where he was sent. He was sent there to spy on the seminary in Reims uh, because they were sure, because Burley and, and Walsingham were sure that the Catholics were plotting to assassinate Queen Elizabeth. The reason why they wanted to assassinate Queen Elizabeth is because they wanted Mary, Queen of Scots, a Catholic, to take over the throne in England. And had she taken over the throne, England would have been back into the Catholic fold, and you would have had another bloody, you know, ma you, know you would have had uh, all sorts of people being hanged and burned at the stake. During Mary's time, a lot of Protestants were burned at the stake. Not a, not a very pleasant way to die. <clears throat> but that's, that was the way they did it in those days. Either they burned you or they chopped your head off. So I don't know which is the nicer way. But remember in those days, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh was beheaded. Here's this great hero, Sir Walter Raleigh, beheaded. Incidentally, his wife took his head and kept it with her. She, they embalmed his head and she kept it with her for as long as she lived and when she died her son she gave it to her, well her son took it and he kept it and when he died it was buried with him so Walter Raleigh's head the Earl of Essex his head he was beheaded also so it shows you you know that uh, <clears throat> Living was dangerous in those days. At the top, the, the people at the very top could lose their heads. <clears throat> and, and so it was quite plausible that Marlowe would have lost his head, but they probably would not have. I think they hanged atheists or, or, or people who claimed to be irreligious, but we know that Penry was hanged and he was a Puritan. Yes? Um. Did you know it well, that was the, the yeah. Well, that's what they claim that it was a brawl, but it was not in a tavern. It was in a private house. Uh, what's what's her name? I forget the name of the woman who ran this particular house, which seemed to serve the purposes of the Secret Service because she was related to Burley. She was a cousin of Burley, who was the top man in the government. So. It all took place there in this, in this particular house in Deptford. But the rumor got out that he was killed in a barroom ball, which was not true at all. Who killed him? Did they come to justice? Or? Well, what, who killed him were Walsingham's own men. Walsingham's men, who were, who were also in the Secret Service with Marlowe, was responsible for the so-called murder, and they claimed that it was self-defense. And so he was let off after two weeks, you know, they had the, the inquest. Here they had the inquest, and this was held in, uh, in Deptford, where this took place, which is near Greenwich. The Queen was at Greenwich, so it was, they called, within the verge, which means that the uh, coroner would be the, uh, the Queen's coroner, uh, Danby. And he had, he gathered these uh, witnesses from the area, none of whom ever had ever known Marlowe or in those days you didn't have pictures, you know. Remember this was before there were such things as picture magazines, before television. So nobody knew what Marlowe looked like. So they saw a, a dead body, they saw a corpse there and, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the person who killed him in self-defense said, yeah, this is Marlowe. And so they, you know, took him at his word, and that's how they were able to do it. It was very skillfully done. This was a, this was, you might say, the perfect murder. Uh, in that it was done so well, and the inquest was so beautifully carried out, 
nice Latin document, and it was only discovered in the 1920s by an American researcher. Uh, nobody knew exactly the, the uh, circumstances of the so-called murder until they were able to get this uh, coroner's inquest, and it describes how it happened in this house, not in a bar room, you know. So that's how we know the, 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 so the circumstances of the so-called murder, and uh, probably Marla was already out of the country when, when this sort of thing took place. I mean, this was really very skillfully done, and it could not have been done without the knowledge of Lord Burley. By then, Francis Walsingham was dead, but Lord Burley, who knew Marlowe very well and wanted to protect this great English genius from being executed, no doubt approved of the whole thing because you couldn't do anything in England like that without Burley knowing about it. So it must have had the approval uh, of Burley. And also he knew that Marlowe was a wonderful spy, a wonderful uh, member of the Secret Service. So he had every... every uh, and, and, and Burley was also very much against the killing of the, the executing of Puritans because he was very favorable toward the Puritans. He sympathized with them and he did not like the idea of hanging Puritans. And so I'm sure he did everything in his power. Whenever he could, he tried to prevent Puritans from being hung, but he couldn't do it all the time because Whitgift, the, the archbishop, was very powerful. And the Puritans were causing so, so many problems for the church. Uh, you had these Puritan writers who were ridiculing the church, writing all kinds of satirical uh, uh, poems and statements about the, uh, about the church hierarchy. And of course, uh, they were the ones who had to go to America to save themselves, you know. But so Burley was basically a man on our side, and, and I, I'm sure that that was his thinking, was that we cannot risk the hanging of this great genius. You know, like the French Revolution, they guillotined everybody, geniuses and, and, and common folk alike. I mean, Lavoisier, the great chemist, was guillotined in France by the uh, French revolutionaries. So there are occurrences where great people are killed by, by lunatic uh, revolutionaries. In this case, Whitgrift was not a lunatic. He was just a, he just didn't like Puritans and he certainly didn't like uh, people like Marlowe. So it's, it's a fascinating story that this, that the world believes that Shakespeare wrote these plays when he actually had nothing to do with them. Yes. Why is um, Marlowe considered an atheist when he writes so much on Christian themes? Well, you know, that's, uh, that's quite interesting. All of that is based on conjecture, uh, hearsay. But when you read his stuff, Marlowe is full of the Bible. And Shakespeare is full of the Bible because Marlowe had a thorough biblical education. He was being groomed to become a member of the clergy. And he got this scholarship from the Archbishop of Canterbury, who before Whitgift, before Whitgift, and so he was being prepared to enter uh, uh, orders. You know, he was going to. And had he had he been a um, religious, he probably could have become uh, Archbishop of England. He was so intelligent and bright and a genius, but he chose to be a poet. And uh, he chose to be a poet at a very dangerous time. And uh, <clears throat> so you had all of these forces at work, and there you have this great genius at work during that period. And of course, we're the beneficiaries of that work, because to this very day, uh, those plays are, you know, revered and played over and over and over again. And uh, you can find an awful lot of... of uh, of Marlowe's own biographical uh, state of mind in those plays themselves. But that seems to be the, the, the real story, you know, behind all of this. Yes? I just did a um, report recently on the originality of Shakespeare's writing, not in regard to somebody else could have written it, but there are so many other resources in the book right. that are found in the writing uh -huh. that they were, you know, they were wondering if, you know, maybe 
people got together and just put the books together or, or whatever. And I, you said Marlo lo loved to read, right? Yes. And he bought many books. Yes. And it, uh, I, thought, I thought it was very interesting to see how. Well, the point is that um, 